Um, I wanted to actually ask uh, people here if anyone wants to share um, um, if, like what they heard, even if you didn't hear anything about GraphQL or you just heard a bit or you played with it a bit, um, maybe people could share um, what they know or what they heard or what they think about and maybe questions they might have and then I can you know I can direct the, the talk directly to what people want so I don't know if anyone wants to uh, open the mic and uh, say something about themselves and what they uh, um, heard about GraphQL and what do they would love to hear from me uh, because I can talk about everything GraphQL and there's a lot to talk about. Um, we're not too many people here, so you know. Uh, Hi, Ori. Hi. Uh, my name is Gergay. Uh, I'm new to GraphQL. I uh, checked the website today, graphql.org, and that's all I, I know about this thing. And I'm interested in Angular and um, yeah, uh, client side development. So generally. Because the last thing I I knew uh, it was GSF and um, jQuery, but it's it's outdated now. Everything <laughs> too old. Yeah. So I'm in, interested in Angular. So general is generally and yeah, that's all. What do you do in your uh, day to day work? In my sorry. In in your day to day work, like uh, what do you do? Ah, I'm I'm um. Well, coding some PHP codes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> that sounds really cool. I mean, actually, uh, in Facebook, uh, uh, the ones that invented GraphQL, uh, they use kind of a weird way of PHP there. And the way that they write their GraphQL schemas is with PHP classes, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I found something PHP in, in the public URL of, of from Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I guess they use PHP. Yeah, they have a weird version of PHP. It's called Hack. It's like uh, mm -hmm. it's a, kind of a PHP compiled to C++. It's something very weird. But, uh, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> you can okay, read about you. it once. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyone else uh, wants to share a bit uh, who they are and uh, if they worked ever with GraphQL, they have certain things, or you want me to just general talk about GraphQL? Um. My name is Tal, and uh, I'm an uh, Angular uh, developer. And uh, currently we are just, uh, we have a few different system and uh, we just converted to a, to NX uh, monorepo and uh, we want uh, to search for alternatives because uh, for now the API, our API we are working, uh, we have uh, auto-generated code using uh, uh, open API and, and uh, we are, uh, I'm checking for alternative because with the monorepo we got uh, some new projects and uh, we want something uh, more flexible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I'll touch with that and I'll touch also about Open API a bit and some tools that we created around the Open API related to GraphQL. Uh, I'll mention two tools that we created that do that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Hey, I am Marcos. Uh, I'm an Angular developer as well. I used uh, GraphQL once in uh, one project. Uh, I would be interested in the bad side of uh, GraphQL because usually the, the internet you will see only GraphQL is awesome. Uh, what I know actually is that uh, only because uh, from my side, I, I think it's awesome because you can uh, fetch uh, the exact data what you need on only that data. So, mm -hmm. but if it's so good, then why should we, why not should we use all the time? So is, is there any uh, disadvantage 
of using GraphQL, so I would be interested in these kind of things. That's a good question. I, I have my own uh, personal opinion about it. Uh, if I'm not mentioning it, then uh, let me know and I'll mention it. During the talk, then I'll mention it after. Um, okay. I'll just share my personal opinion. I think everyone has all kinds of opinions about that. It's a very uh, uh, delicate issue, but yeah, I'll share my... Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyone else or should I start? Uh, wants to introduce themselves, ask uh, some questions or request something that I should uh, talk about. Then maybe I would also join the people who ask the question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also working as an Angular developer, de developer actually full time. And we are using, of course, REST. Not, not of course, but uh, basically mm -hmm. uh, at many places, uh, people are using REST and we are also using REST. And we are using quite a lot of Swagger. And we are also generating the client uh, from, from the Swagger uh, mm -hmm. definition document. And yeah. uh, actually, this would be which I would be happy to, to, to compare or see a comparison mm -hmm. from you. Like, uh, what other tools should I use if I want to switch GraphQL? What would be the advantages, disadvantages, and so on? OK. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll... Um, yeah, I, I have a whole section about, we created two libraries specifically for, I had the idea specifically re related to other APIs that are not GraphQL and specifically open API and Swagger. Um, yeah, I'll touch on that for sure. Um, let me share my screen and let me know. What uh Oops, one question. I'm sorry. Like uh, I should have talked uh, when Master said similar. Adding to Master, right? Like I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So adding to Master, right? Like uh, in I mean I don't know how we are doing in our current project. I just joined this project and I found out like uh, they're trying to generate the client Angular components using GraphQL. So they will have all the markup, everything uh, uh, stored um, within GraphQL, like at the backend. And uh, like meaning like the hierarchy of each of the HTML components and all, and they're generating all these uh, HTML oh. templates that through this uh, dynamic uh, component factory resolver. They are trying to load these Angular components using GraphQL, and they're getting the data through GraphQL, and then uh, they are looping through all those uh, fields and all, and they're generating that. Uh, just like if you can touch that, like uh, how to generate a dynamic component uh, through the GraphQL from backend, that would be really good. Or at least if you can give me some references or something, that would be awesome. So, so you want to um, rep so you want to have like a generic components, and then you want to basically structure their the component tree through GraphQL. So to yes, yes, yes. Build yes. a GraphQL query that represents a component tree. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think I, I know about a library that does that for React. Um, so, but, but also uh, we are the ones who created the GraphQL code generator, which is probably tool you could reuse in order or repurpose to do something like that. But uh, that's an interesting question. Okay, so I'll start, um, tell me, so I have a bunch of slides. Um, so maybe jump around between them. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, do you see now, um, my question is, what do you see now? Do you see just a screen or you see also the presenter's notes? Um, because I have two screens that I'm, and I'm sharing just one of them and I, I'm not sure which one are you seeing? I can tell you what I see. I'm not sure that we will see the same thing, but what I see is basically the your presentation on the big screen and uh -huh. next to it on the right, I see your camera on the top and after oh. that, every other people. But you don't see presenter notes or anything like that? No, no, no. Oh, okay, okay. Good. Um, okay, so um, first I'll may maybe say two words about myself. Uh, I'm a, my name is Uli and I started a group. Um, so personally, I worked many years ago in a company called uh, Meteor GS. I don't know if any of you heard about it. It's like, uh, it used to be a full stack framework. Uh, JavaScript framework, like with real time and 
and things like that. And then I wrote basically the, the library called Angular Meteor that uh, connected the, the Ang uh, basically replaced Meteor's uh, own UI with uh, UI framework with Angular. Uh, and that made me actually join Meteor, the company. And then when we thought about what Meteor 2.0 would look like, actually Facebook released GraphQL. And then uh, we, we basically turned the Meteor into a company called Apollo, uh, Apollo GraphQL. I don't know if you heard about them. Uh, and we basically started like the whole, so we started basically building GraphQL tools from the start. And then later on, uh, I actually, I thought that there could be another way of building open source tools. Um, there could be a group of individuals uh, and the group will be supported like by all the other individuals. Um, and I thought that it's a better model to uh, make long-term sustainable open source libraries. Um, so I started this group, it's called the Guild. This is our website, theguild.dev. Um, and we, uh, develop a lot of open source tools in the group. Um, uh, just, you know, some of them that if you're in the GraphQL world, you heard, and if not, that's okay. Uh, GraphQL code generator is one of them. It's a tool that um, you could take GraphQL schema and uh, queries, and it will generate um, or typings for your backend or uh, um, typings for your frontend. Um, or even ready-made SDKs. Uh, so some people mentioned like, you know, uh, in relation to, um, uh, to like Swagger SDKs and things like that. So this is basically the equivalent of the Swagger code gen just for GraphQL. And because GraphQL has a bit more abilities, it can do more. Uh, so I can touch on that for people who are aware of like Swagger code gen. Um, GraphQL Inspector is another one. Like one of the things in GraphQL is that you can prevent breaking changes easily. Um, and you could, instead of having your API be V1, V2, you have more options uh, in order to evolve your, your, your API. So GraphQL Inspector is an open source tool that helps you with that. Helps you, it helps you make sure basically uh, not to break uh, your API. Uh, GraphQL modules, which is like, let's say you're building a huge GraphQL gateway, uh, you can, with GraphQL modules, you could separate um, separate the parts of the schema into separate teams and they will feel like they're working individually, but at the end of the day, it will compile into one gateway. Uh, and GraphQL tools, uh, which is, we, we have many, many libraries, GraphQL mesh as well. Uh, I'll mention all of these uh, and there's many more. Like we really um, basically are the biggest, uh, the largest open source group in GraphQL today, more than Apollo and more than anyone else. Um, and all of the tools that we build are basically being combined. You can combine them into a full stack platform, but they're completely individual because the idea behind GraphQL in general and that we really believe in it is that you could start integrated very easily in one small place in your app. Like you don't need to do a big transition and replace all your REST API with GraphQL or something like that. You could actually start using GraphQL today on your client with all your APIs still being REST. And I'll talk about that as well. So that's the philosophy of the group and us. Um, now let's talk a bit about GraphQL itself. So. Um, GraphQL itself, uh, what it is, it's, uh, uh, maybe, you know what, I'll open for a second. Um, let me open the website itself, because I think um, someone mentioned GraphQL.org here, then also I'm now, we are now the maintainers of the, of, the, of, the, of the website. So by the way, if you have things to improve or you think we can improve there here, let me know. So I'll just go through it quickly because I think it's just, it's like a very good slide. So GraphQL is, a, is an API query language. What does it mean? Um, it means that you could basically create a schema, what you see here, that represents your data. And you can see it's a very simple language like types, similar to TypeSwift or Java or .NET or things like that. Like it's a very easy way to describe what your APIs is actually exposing. Um, 
And it also, you can create here, it's a graph because you can create connections. You see, you see a project has contributors and contributors is from another type that we, it's not in display here, that's called the user. So now we can have, like basically we can, and so that's, let's say you can think of that as, so let's say similar to Swagger or JSON schema or something like that. Something that just describes your API. The difference is here is that the client not only, um, can query for an endpoint, it can ask, it, it, it not only call an endpoint, but it can ask for what they actually need. In that case, the client just want a specific project and just the tagline of the project. So what we will get back over the network or as a result is just that field. You know, so when you think about it, if we look here, you can see if I'm querying one field, I will get one. And if not, I'll get two. So that's a, Big benefit uh, if we want to, let's say, I don't know, for example, first of all, it's, it means that this is a very easy way to format your, um, your API, uh, your results. Um, but also it means that if you put it over the network, you're gonna send much less data. And all, not only that you're, because sometimes you have an API that re, you know, gives you back like 50 fields that you have no idea where they're coming from um so now you could decide what you want to get back and the most important thing here in my opinion is that it's predictable like sometimes if you worked in with backends one day they send you one thing the next day they send you something else and and, and you have no guarantee of what's go, what's going on even if they use swagger it's not a real guarantee because the api itself could change and the swagger definitions won't which is something very common that the, the, the API definitions are actually not up to date with the actual API. With GraphQL, it's impossible because GraphQL also does validation at runtime. So, you know, because you send a query, you know you will get back that specific result and nothing else. So that's really cool. Uh, so it gives you guarantees. Like if you use the Swagger code gen, the Swagger code gen could give you TypeScript typings, but if the backend behind the scenes is changing, you will get different data than what you expect from the Swagger cogen. In GraphQL, it's impossible. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that in this case, you know, we're querying here for also the connections, you know, like a hero and the hero's friends. And for each friend, we want the name. And usually what we would happen is that we send one REST request, get back one result, uh, and then send another REST request for the additional data we want and get another result. Here we can send one query for everything we want to render on the page. And GraphQL will get all that information for us and get uh, and orchestrate all the different calls and the different sources and will send us back one single result. So that means that we can actually remove a lot of code, a lot of network code that we do today. Uh, and also, again, if we do it on the network, instead of multiple requests and responses, it's much faster because we have one request and one response. So that's really, really cool. Like I said, we, we have the type system. So when we write the query, we know exactly what we're gonna get and it's a guarantee. So that's why the GraphQL code generator is so powerful because we have all this information. Um, and because we have all this information, what you see here is like all kinds of developer tools that we could get while working with that API. Like what you see here, you see how to complete, you know, you see, um, documentation and you get it also inside your IDE. Let's say you use VS Code or JetBrains or um, you know, WebStorm and you see you, you have an error here. Um, all these things you get in development and it feels like it's like, I don't know, a TypeScript code that you get in your app, but that's actually an API of another theme. So that's another thing that is very powerful with GraphQL because of the powerful type system, you get validations of the API at while you're developing and not only in production. So that saves a lot, a lot of time. Um, yeah, and there's more things like evolving the schema. Um, I would say here also, um, I'm, I'm just gonna finish this thing and go back to my si slide, slides. I think that, um, so the backend actually could be implemented with anything. So, um, any language. So the backend could be JavaScript, could be .NET, could be C++, could be anything. PHP, someone said, like, it doesn't matter. Um, just like any, like, just like a REST API. Okay. 
Um, and of course, it's, you know, today GraphQL is extremely pop uh, popular. Um, now, let me go back to the slides. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, let me jump. Yeah, so I mentioned a bit about, I already mentioned about like, you know, we can save the extra run strips with GraphQL. Uh, also the offer fetching, you know, sometimes we call an API and we get tons of fields that we don't need. This is an example from the GitHub API. Um, so, you know, with GraphQL, we don't need that. We just query for the things that we need. Uh, and that's all, we won't get all this crazy amount of uh, stuff. Um, so let's see how it works, okay, a bit. So what you see here is uh, we're putting a GraphQL, you can call it server or engine between our client, between our Angular app and the data source. And let's say in this case, the data source um, is our existing servers that now use REST APIs. Let's say Java servers or .NET servers and they expose REST APIs. But what, what we do usually is that we look at the app itself. When we build the GraphQL schema, we go and think product first, like Angular first. So we look at the Angular app and we look at the UI and we try to think if we had the perfect, um, the perfect uh, schema, the perfect API that will make us do le the least amount of work on our app, how would it look like? So, and then we create that schema. So now in this case, we created a schema that's with user and message and user has messages and messages has, have content. So first thing, now what the client could do is the client could ask for, let's say a specific user, user with ID two and its name. So the client sends one request to GraphQL. GraphQL goes and first brings the user object and then brings the user name. And maybe it was a REST request or maybe it was two REST requests, it doesn't matter. But the client received one result Run, it sends one request, receive, received run, one result that looks exactly like the query that we got with just the information that we needed, not more, not less. So that's already pretty cool. But let's say the, the uh, query is a bit more complicated. We want the user name and the user messages and their contents. So let's say this is the query. So again, the, the client sends one request, GraphQL automatically brings the user then in parallel could bring the user name and the messages like the uh, let's say it's a list of messages and let's say the messages are actually the content is sitting on like a third party api or a cms or something so graphql would also bring all the content of the messages but all of this is hidden for the client the client will get um just the data that they need um in just single request so that's pretty cool right because um we got um, less requests and less data over the network. And we got an automation here, right? But what we saw a bit is that GraphQL started sending multiple requests through the network. Automatically, it understood that it could efficiently bring some stuff in parallel and orchestrate some of the API calls. So think about it for a second. I'll get to that point in a second. Let's look a bit deeper at how GraphQL actually looks inside. So, you know, we talked about the schema. The schema basically is representing functions. So each field, let's say the user age or the user's name is just a simple function that, and it's arbitrary function. And that's the interesting thing about GraphQL. That's why you can implement GraphQL anywhere. So GraphQL could be on top of existing REST APIs. It could be on top of databases. It could be for local storage. Uh, NGRX, you know, all kinds of tools, like any data that you can think of, because the way we present data in GraphQL is just a function. So it's called resolvers. Um, and you can see we have those small boxes like username and user age. What does it mean? It just means that those are functions that they, we know that they're gonna get an object, in this case, an object from the type user. And then they're going to do whatever we want, maybe call a remote server or something, and bring back a string that represents the username. So that's actually the code that we need to write in GraphQL, that we actually manually write. 
And we can write any code there as long as we return the right uh, information. But then what I'm going to show you in this slide is actually everything you're going to see in this slide is uh, automatic. GraphQL is doing that for you. So what I want you to think maybe while I'm like showing the slide is where do you do that code today? Because today you're doing that code somewhere. So what GraphQL does after we created those simple functions is GraphQL gets the query that we saw the scene before, like they give me the user and give me the user messages. And for each message, give me the title and the date of the message. Now, what GraphQL would do here, this is let's say the GraphQL functions. That's the core of what GraphQL is doing. GraphQL automatically will get the first box, get user, will send the number ID 10, and we'll get back a user object. Then it will say, oh, okay, but you want the name and the messages. So let me bring the name and the messages and I'll send the user object for both of them in parallel and I will execute both of them in parallel. With the name, I get the actual result so I can put it in place. With the messages, I actually get an array of three messages. And now for each message, I actually want to get just the title and the date. So I'll run all of these in parallel. And as I get the results, I'm putting them in the right place and I'll send you back the result. Um, so this thing is happening automatically. Now I want you to think, where in your code today, when you, you ask for the data that you want to render for your Angular components, and then you fetch all the data for multiple places, and then you filter the information that you don't need and you format that information and then you display it. All that work that you do today, whether you're doing it on the back end or whether you're doing it on the front end, now GraphQL can do it automatically for you. So in my opinion, the real benefits of GraphQL are the ones that everyone is talking about, which is the network performance, right? Like you have less requests over the, the network and less data over the network but I think it's also the automation and the order. So now we get to build the schema of the data that we're actually using on the Angular app, you know, because the API usually represents more data or more generic data than what we actually need in the Angular app. Here we can actually represent the data that we want as Angular developers. And all the network calls that we're doing can now be automated. We can just build those queries that are the GraphQL queries inside our Angular components and GraphQL will automate all this work for us. So I think, you know, those are the big, big benefits of GraphQL. Um, now, then comes the question, um, where should I start from? You know, okay, this sounds cool. Where do I start from using GraphQL? And everyone usually starts from a GraphQL gateway or server, right? Because they think about the performance benefits. But I think not. I think actually the answer for this is, where do you do that logic today? And, you know, because I told you like those things you're doing today, you're just doing it manually in code. You're writing code to do that. So what I usually see is that people have an app, has an app or a web app or a mobile app, it doesn't matter. And what's happening today with REST usually, that app is sending requests, REST requests over the network and then doing all that work on the front end. So what I usually, that we usually do in companies when we consult, we consult to a lot of like very large companies and startups, but so what we usually do is that we take all that manual work that they do in Angular or React or on the front end or mobile, and we actually take and build a GraphQL engine on the client. We, and then we just, instead of just you know, saving network requests or things like that, what we've done is it's simpler. We took the code that we wrote before and we just automated it inside the client. Um, and I think that's much easier way to start with GraphQL because you also don't need to go and convince people that like GraphQL is great or special. Uh, you can just take even one simple you know, REST endpoint and call that endpoint from the resolvers of GraphQL. Um, so it's just like a client side application, you know, a, a client side NPM library. Like you don't need to like do a whole architectural change and everything. And actually once you've done that and you automated a lot of the work and you ordered a lot of code in your app, 
And I can bet you that if you will do that, you will remove a lot of code from your app and your app will have much less lines of code. And then everything, when everything working, if you want, you can actually take this, all this code and move it as a node server, just as is. And then you will also save the network band to that band bandwidth that we talked before. You send one request and one response. And then, you know, over the network, it will also be faster, but you don't have to. There's many people that are actually running GraphQL on the client. So that's something that is, uh, people don't know so much about. Um, now, people mentioned um, the, the Swagger cogen. So again, you know, I, like I said before, um, we can look on those resolvers, how we write the actual code. And those resolvers has, we know the input and we know the output. So we can take GraphQL code generator and actually generate the inputs and the outputs of those functions. So we have fully typed workflow without writing typings. Most of them are actually just generated for us uh, thanks to uh, GraphQL code. So I, I want to touch a bit about a couple of libraries that I think when people just talk about GraphQL, uh, they, uh, they don't aware, they're not aware that they exist and we create it. So, in most cases, this is the process, what I just showed you now, this is the process of how people started using GraphQL. It started from actually the front-end developers that understood how valuable GraphQL it is for them. They started building it inside the client or in a gateway, whatever they're comfortable with. Uh, and they actually started building those resolvers and adding automatic types. And you know that's already got them a lot of benefits. But then comes the question of, Inside those resolvers, I still call the old APIs. Like let's say I used to have uh, REST APIs that are not typed. Well, let's say, because most APIs, most REST APIs are not typed. And also if they're typed, you can't really rely on the typings because if something changes, not necessarily means that the swagger or the JSON schema will be up to date. So what we actually have here is that with, with GraphQL, um, you know, we have our functions, the way that the functions that call the existing APIs being typed on the input and the output. But when we actually call the HTTP, the old HTTP, we still don't have types. So we started thinking, you know, after people came to us and they already used GraphQL and they were happy, but they wanted to get more of the benefits also on the backend, we started thinking, how could we actually use those, all those benefits, not only between the client and the GraphQL, but also between the, the, the backend and GraphQL. Like, could we take the existing APIs that we have today and do something about it? Because now with GraphQL, we know it could be better. So, um, so one, um, one way of doing that, that a lot of people are, you know, that very enthusiastic about GraphQL, they're like, okay, let's change all the different uh, backends into GraphQL, which is cool. And maybe it's possible, or maybe we'll build like a small gateway in front of all the different APIs that we have. And that's okay. A lot, some people are doing that. And I guess in smaller companies, it's actually possible. But in large companies, it doesn't make any sense because there's so many existing APIs and there's not a chance that they're going to like just leave everything and going to write a new protocol. They don't care. Usually they don't give a fuck at all. So um, what's really happened, so what we thought is like, could we do something with the existing APIs without needing to rewrite them or without needing to add a new technology to them? Like, could we you know, what do we actually want from GraphQL? And we asked ourselves what we want. And I think what we love in GraphQL is the schema and the query language and the engine. Like that's what I just showed you, like the automation part. We care a bit less about the network performance because this is on the backend. So, you know, we don't really care. It's not over the network. And what we thought was, look, there's actually existing protocols, right? Like there's a, Swagger, like people said, an open API. Um, there's JSON schema, there's gRPC, um, SOAP, OData. There's all kinds of like existing, um, there's all kinds of like existing protocols. So 
what we thought, and maybe even there's like an existing API, but uh, that doesn't have any schema, but we can look at the actual responses and we could like generate a schema from the actual live data. So, because those ex APIs are there. So how could we take all of those existing schemas and protocols, the live data and the docs, and, you know, could we, um, uh, could we create like a, um, uh, wait. could we create like a, you know, like a schema of what's going on there? Um, you know, and so we thought about like all kinds of ways. Um, and, uh, and we came up with an interesting solution. Um, so now the thing is, um, so we keep, kept thinking about it, but then what we, what we also did in the past, something that I've done in the past before, when I started working with GraphQL, um, I started thinking, you know, there was all this debate, GraphQL or REST. And I thought that actually GraphQL is a superset of REST. It has everything you could do with REST. So I had this idea of a library called SOFA. If GraphQL is a superset of REST, that means that I could probably take GraphQL and generate REST APIs from it. And that's what we've done. So we took a GraphQL API. This is an open source library. You could use it today. You can take GraphQL API and you could generate a Swagger and an open API out of it. Like you can get like a fully functioning Graph uh, REST Open, uh, uh, open API uh, uh, that, that is completely generated from GraphQL. Uh, so that's a library we already created. But this time we wanted to do something different, right? We wanted to look at the existing REST APIs and we wanted to generate GraphQL out of it. So basically taking those schemas that we have and whatever schemas, whatever API, automatically generate GraphQL from it. So this is the library that you created. It's called GraphQL Mesh. What GraphQL Mesh is doing uh, is basically the tagline is query anything, run anywhere. So GraphQL Mesh can take any source you can think of, open API Swagger, gRPC, SOAP, OData, SQL, uh, all kinds of data source you can think of, and it will generate GraphQL out of it. And then what that means is you can query GraphQL, but the, the source is actually not GraphQL. So you can already get some of the benefits of GraphQL. Like you could like get the query language and you get all the typings and everything without actually needing to write GraphQL. So you can do that. And then, you know, let's say we took all those different services, the old services, we generated GraphQL from them. We can then even merge them into one single GraphQL API. So that's um, GraphQL Mesh. Uh, I don't want to jump. I'm, 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 so like I said, it can all, um, take any source. I'm going to maybe jump a bit because I think this is like the continuation here. I think it's a bit more um, complicated. Like, And I don't want to jump here before uh, like you know, in, in like subject that maybe is not interesting, but I'll just mention that, um, wait, why is my first year wrong? Uh, can't see my cursor. Okay, I can see it now. Okay, so, um, but I'll just mention the GraphQL Mesh. The idea here is that I can take this, all those different sources, merge them together, into one single gateway, like you see here, but I can also merge them all and then generate SDKs from that. So I can actually take my Angular app, feed all the different existing sources that I have and generate an SDK for my Angular app. So my Angular app will feel like I'm querying GraphQL for all the different sources, but actually over the network, it will send the original calls like REST or gRPC. So that's something that I think most people don't know is possible. Um, there's may, now there's way, many more um, 
libraries that I can share with you today. I told you like, you know, we have all those different libraries of all the different parts of the stack, but I think, you know, I gave a bit of a big overview of GraphQL and I thought maybe we could do some questions and at least I can give you some resources to where you could go and start. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, and, and if you have a question, like, and according to the questions, I have way more slides on many more tools here. So, you know, if you want to, uh, if it will be relevant, then I'll, I'll show you more. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. So uh, we are waiting for the questions. And meanwhile, uh, as long as you don't have any questions, I have one. Basically, okay. I would be happy to, I have an exact uh, use case in my mind and I would be very curious, what would, what would be your strategy to change from an existing uh, REST and Swagger setup to a fully featured GraphQL setup? Uh, let's say we have an Angular on the front end we have, for example, simple Node.js on the back end, and everything is standard REST API, uh, REST mm -hmm. API, and we are generating uh, with with uh, certain um, annotations uh, the Swagger um, Open API documentation, and yeah. from this we generate also a client library which we are using on the front end, and as far as I understood. Uh, using Mesh, I could use the existing uh, Swagger doc, so the Open API documentation, without yeah. changing anything on the backend, right? Yeah. But then that also means, uh, also in the future, I have to keep this Swagger documentation up to date, so I still have to use all the annotations and stuff, right? Yeah, so so um, in your case, so first of all, when people ask me like what, um, sorry, when people ask me what, like what, um, where should they start with GraphQL, I'm actually asking first, what is the current pain point you have? Because if you don't have any pain points, meaning like um, looking at your setup, you have, let's say, you, it looks like you have like a good setup, right? Everything is TypeScript. Um, so you get all the types, uh, and you probably have the CI actually build the, the SDK for the front end. So you get the full type guarantee. Um, and um, uh, so th the typings is probably something that you're already comfortable. That's not, you know, that's not your problem. The question is then what, what is your problem and where would you start with GraphQL? I mm -hmm. think, um, now, there, it also depends on the app. So for example, um, um, so, so for example, I think that if you have, uh, um, if your app is just one app and you build the whole API according to this one app and it looks exactly as you wish and you don't do a lot of, you don't need to do a lot of work on the, on the front end, that's also okay. But what if you start having like the app starts to be more complex? Um, and, uh, and you need different, and you start writing code basically, um, that, um, manipulates the, takes the API results and start to manipulate it, you know, like for whatever thing you want, that will be a place that I would start looking at GraphQL because then instead of writing that code, you could write GraphQL queries on the components of your Angular app next to the components of your GraphQL app, and then basically save the, this work for you. It will save you a bunch of like um, code that you will write in order to manipulate, right? Because you saw like GraphQL automatically takes your query, then figures out how to get this data from the API. That's one thing. Another thing that I think, that's one area that you could start from. Um, and again, this is because you have a nice setup and everything. Um, Another thing that I would actually look at is the biggest difference between GraphQL and uh, Swagger or other, other stuff is that um, th the biggest difference there is that GraphQL creates, uh, the client sends a query, right? So you could understand in production what are actually the fields that are being queried. Um, let's say you, you release a mobile app or you have a lot of web apps. 
and you want to slowly deprecate fields, but you don't know actually which field which fields the the UI is using because. When you query an endpoint, like let's say a RESTful endpoint, you take all the data, and then the app is doing, you know, in code, picks just the things that it needs and builds it. But it, that means that you can you don't. It's it's harder to build automated tools that will tell you, hey, nobody is using this field anymore. You could delete it. Mm -hmm. um, so. But if, but there's also a way because you know let's say if, if it's not a big app and everything is TypeScript and everything, you know it's not necessarily something that would be very beneficial for you and until you get to this point where you start seeing oh I need to start creating versioning of my of my uh, APIs or things like that. Another thing on top of that is that if you have actually a simple API a simple app. What you could also do, and, and you just build like this very simple RESTful API over a database. With GraphQL, what you could do is you could actually translate your GraphQL queries into SQL queries. Mm. So then you could actually skip, if you want to be like very you know efficient, you could actually skip that REST API part, right? You could take basically you're 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 having a, a layer that basically generates GraphQL API from your database. And then you could just send queries to the database and save a bunch of work, you know, and be very type safe even more. Okay. So that's also something cool. Like that's like you could use yeah. Mesh on Postgres, for example, or um, MySQL or things like that. So that's I another place. And, and what's the name of the library for that? So GraphQL Mesh has a couple of uh, database handlers. Okay. There's another library called PostgreSQL. What what database do you use? Postgres. It's Postgres. Yeah, at this case. So um, I'll send you here uh, the some of the websites. GraphQL Mesh uses under the hood the tool called called PostgreSQL. I'll put it here. Um, this is that. I'll also link to PostgreSQL. And I will also link to a to a cool um, solution called Azura, which is kind of like a Firebase over Postgres. Oh, that automatically yeah. expose real time APIs um, over your Postgres existing Postgres database. Mm -hmm. So it's really really cool. Yeah, sounds also very cool. Then we might we had a question from. From another Marcel, mm -hmm. we used like queries previously to send data over web sockets, but it was very hard to use. Is it also improved in the past four or five years? Oh yeah, uh, actually, yeah, very much. Um, let me say, so. This is actually something. Like, this is like a personal subject that I care a lot about because when I, when I said when I worked at Meteor and we turned into Apollo, I cared about actually building Meteor over GraphQL, meaning the live data and subscriptions was something very important to me i'll send here um like um, a talk that i gave a long time ago um in 2017 but most of it's more like a general talk so everything there i think is still relevant um about what is graphical subscriptions and what is live queries and since then you know a lot of stuff didn't change until recently. So recently, um, we actually released a couple of things. First of all, we released a much better um, WebSocket library. Uh, let me find the, re the release blog post. Um, so I'm putting it here. So it's much, much better WebSocket library. By the way, there's also a really, really good SSE uh, uh, so server side event like like live like, uh, libraries and graphical subscriptions over uh, uh, server side events uh, in HTTP two. So that's also something we now support much better. I'll also link to um, uh, but let me also link to a uh, we also wrote a library for live queries. Finally, uh, after many many years, um, let me find. This is a very, very in-depth blog post that we just published. And I'll also link to uh, 
basically a, a repo that demonstrates all of those things in a really cool way. Uh, So we in the guild, we really care about the subject. And now finally you have good solutions about it. Like some of these tools I didn't mention because I didn't want to go too deep. Um, I, I hope everyone can see the links here. Um, so the last one is basically a playground where you could play with like, you know, you could uh, basically send everything through HTTP, HTTP multipart and WebSocket. You can just replace the transports however you like. Um, you could use subscriptions, you could use live queries. There's also, you, you use their, all the new tools that we have, like uh, GraphQL Helix uh, that I didn't mention here, and Envelope that I didn't mention here, but those are really, really powerful new tools. Like if, if until now, when you heard about back, GraphQL backend, you heard that you need to use Apollo, that's not true anymore. There's better tools. Um, so uh, Envelope is one of them, and this playground demonstrates most of them. Um, yeah, and I think there you could actually, um, yeah, this is a very, very, there, there's examples of all the cool new stuff there. So I highly recommend this. Uh, I hope it uh, will answer your question. And if not, let me also post here, there's like, um, there's a, the community links of, of GraphQL. One of them is we just moved to like an official Discord channel and we're hanging out there. So you can just come and ask me or anyone questions there. And um, yeah, you can just direct, everyone can here can just direct, you know, message me. You can, if you want, you can also like, my email is public on my GitHub. So I'll link it here as well. So if you want to email me or anything like that, feel free. Got it. Thank you very much. Anybody, uh, further questions? If not, then maybe I would have one last question. You you refer to GraphQL many times as a gateway, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but the gateway means is this case that it would be it would be a logic uh, a layer on the front end, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, finish the question and then I'll, I'll rephrase the answer according to that. Okay. okay. But basically, this is the question. What was how should I imagine this gateway? So is this something on the front end or is this something really on a different server? Because uh... yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So it's a bit the interesting thing or how I think about GraphQL and I think it's related to also someone that asked the, one of the first questions is I think that for me, the biggest difference in GraphQL is like, if we imagine REST, it's basically a function call. Like I call a function and I get back a result. I don't decide what the result's gonna be. I have no effect on it. And I don't send the function anything about what I'm, going, what I'm needing for that function. Um, GraphQL is a query language. So I send the query of what I need and I, then I get back a result. So the, the, the function that gets the, receives the request for me knows more about what I need and can do more. It's a very high level what I'm saying right now, but from that you can do all kinds of things like you know, returning the right things, doing validations on it, sending less data, all this orchestrating, all these things is because there's a query language. Now, I think if you look at GraphQL like that, I think you can look at GraphQL just as a function, meaning it's a better function right? or a more elaborate function. So um, now when you think about it like that, you could use it anywhere. You could use it on the client. You can use it as a gateway on the backend between the back, your services and your client. And you could even use it as service to service communication. Mm -hmm. um, so most people, when they hear about GraphQL, they think about the classical use cases, like you have a client, you have a gateway on the server that talks to all the different clients, that's the GraphQL, and then you have all the different services underneath. I think it's actually can run anywhere. Okay. And okay. you could use it everywhere. So that's why it's like more flexible. So, you know, if let's say the performance doesn't matter for you, you can actually put stock and just putting it on the front end, that's it. Um, 
got yeah. it got it and if you if you are starting your backend from the beginning to be kind of GraphQL compatible, then is there anything special you have to do? Like, uh, do you also use like Swagger like annotations or something to, to be able? To... Yeah. So how you write your backend? There's many different ways. So one of the things, let's say, if you use uh, um, something like NestJS, right? Like NestJS, you write annotations and. So in SJS, it takes your annotations and actually generates GraphQL also. Like the same way that it generates the, the Swagger, it can generate REST. So you could do that if you like the way of writing. You write your TypeScript class first, and then you generate the stuff from it. Um, you could also do the other way around. You can say, write the GraphQL schema first. Say, this is the API that I want you to do, and then generate the implementation. So this is what the other code gen is doing. The, like I'll send here um, uh, yeah, I'll send here um, a related uh, thing to that. What we usually do is we start with writing the GraphQL schema and then we generate the typings for the resolvers. But both are possible. So you could do um, it's called the code first or the schema first. So I think something like what you want, um, there's a couple of libraries that are doing something similar. I'll send you some of them here. One is type GraphQL. Another one is here. I can't find the other one, but basically this one, and also there's a Nexus GraphQL. I'll send this as well. And then there's the schema first way of doing it, which is how we do it. And to do that, you, you use the library called the GraphQL tools. I see, thank you. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Um, I also meant I also link here to the Apollo Angular uh, library, which also we maintain. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to actually, this is like a GraphQL client. Apollo is a graph Apollo client is a GraphQL client, and this is how you integrate it into um, into your Angular app if you want. You don't have to use it by the way. You can just use GraphQL much more simply, like with a library called GraphQL Request. Uh, well got it um and maybe if we jump back to the really beginning of your presentation where you showed an, an example about how you request users and messages and how you combine that uh can you maybe um in a couple of minutes just show a bit more complex example like can you also filter for the messages or can it be maybe even a, a deeper request where we also have objects in the message and can we kind of combine these these filters and how how does a bit more complex uh, request look like um let me see if i i can just go for something uh like i'll go i'll go for something ready uh because i don't have a live anything live here but i'll there's a live uh, demo here, so I can just. Do you see my screen with the introduction of GraphQL? Yes, we see. Okay, so I'll just jump through some things here. So here, like you can see, this is the query. I'm asking for a hero and a name. Um, but I can, you know, I can start asking for more things, right? I can start and the more, and then I get these things and I can get more, right? I can get also the friends of friends, right? And this could go as deep as I want. Um, so this is just regular fields. Um, for me, if you, for me, well, what I want to see is basically um, if you, because you know, as, as I'm not using GraphQL, I'm thinking all the time in the uh, REST data resources. If I could see what are the available resources, like for example, I say slash messages, then I get a list of messages. If I say slash me, then I get one single user, which is me. Uh, 
and and you said a very good example with this user and messages and then i get also my user and also my messages and my question is okay but what if i want to filter for the messages which i got from a certain uh certain other user how how does it look like if you filter for that so first of all um let, let me, i think the best thing to demonstrate graphql compared to is the swappy graphql api um let me open why because there's a swappy rest api and then it's like it was like a an api of how to do um rest best practices mm -hmm. and here you basically compare the two so here you see you have like swappy and people right and you want person one right and then you send a request and you do that mm -hmm. with swappy here i can just um i can get let's say um all people and then um let's um I don't know. Um, I think here I can get autocomplete. Right. Yeah, so I can get people, and for each person, I can get, well, let's say the name. So I get all the people and all their names, and you see it just one now. But we want to filter, right? So yes, exactly. um, what you see here is like now filtering is not coming out of the box. Filtering is what the um, what the API um, tells you you could filter, Got it. and you could structure it as however you want. Uh, what I want to mention is that if you let's say you generate REST API, a uh, GraphQL API from your database, you get all the filterings from the database in your GraphQL automatically. You can do greater than, smaller than, joins, all of these things automatically. But here, this is what they decided to implement. So here, let's see. You also get generated. Here, you can you see you can generate all the diff, like um, all the, the documentation automatically is generated for you. So here, you can see we can say I don't know. We want to filter, so let's let's get the first uh, three. So I get just the th first three. Or in people, let's say we have people connection, and then we have people. This gives us a person. But what we could also do is like, um, and, and the filtering we can do on all people is just those first step before, you know, before, you know, I think before gives us and last in. So, but we can also ask for a specific person. You see here, like I can say, um, let's see if they have an ID for the person. Yes, ID. So let's get the ID. Let's say this is the ID of Luke, Sky, Luke Skywalker. So now I can say here, let's say person um, ID, person ID this give me the name okay, let's see if it's id maybe yeah and i get to skyward so the filtering is uh the filtering that's possible depends on what i expose um and there's all kinds of so what you see here by the way is like um films connection now, what you see here, this is, um, I want to get films. So I can get all the films, but also I, because I have edges and page info, those are pagination filterings. That are, that are, it's like, a, it's like a, a standard of how you do filtering in GraphQL and Relay. It's, it's called the Relay. Anyway, it's, so you decide on the filterings. Um, so you decide how you filter stuff here. They just took, what they did is they took the same filtering from this REST API and just implemented it here. And, and can, you, can you also combine the same request with different uh, attributes? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's say we want, you for mean example, like- mm -hmm. if, if you have, for example, three different IDs and I want to get uh, these three different people, can I send three different person requests? 
So that depends on your GraphQL implementation. You need to implement it. You can in some APIs, in some APIs you can. Um, so here I don't think they implemented it because you see here, they just accept on planet or on species or on um, person, you just get ID, but you can. Um, here you can do an array of IDs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or you can give two options. Um, and then you need to implement it. But yeah, everything is possible. Like, I wonder if there's like a public post Raphael API. I don't know if they have a live example. Um, let's see. Okay, so basically the uh, the, the the backend should be prepared for that, right? So yeah, uh, so, so should... you can implement any filterings you want, but uh, okay, again, because... if your API is not generated from a database like here, like in PostgreSQL, file, you need to add those features because okay. it's like if if the backend can't handle multiple IDs, it won't do it for you. Got it. Actually, I was expecting that maybe I can, you know, just like uh, when we ask for a user and we ask for the messages, we could combine it to two requests. And now basically we are talking about three requests, but we can't combine them, right? It depends. No, if you build so user and message, let's 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 get it. I think this is different. What you're saying. I think let's 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 say we want. Um, let's think about it. Let's say we have. Let's see what we have here. We have films. So let, let's take all films, for example. Um, so we have films. Films is one resource. I can get the film uh, title, let's say. So let's get all the titles. Um, and let's, I don't know, filter by uh, first four. So I have only the first four. Now, the thing is, I also want to query for the people, right? But I want to query for the people in the film. So what here I can have, the, now the, this is the connection that you create, uh, that you, this is the graph that you build for your app. So your app, they don't care just about people. If it's people that are in films, they have a role, for example. So um, you can ask for a director which is of type people, or you could ask for uh, characters. So let's get all the characters. Um, and let's get their names. Let's get, uh, not everyone, but let's get the, um, the first um, four as well. So, you did, you see the, those were two separate requests, mm -hmm. but now it's one. But because you create the, the, the schema told you there's a connection between them. The schema said, what is a film? A film has, um, what did we ask for? Character, character connection. Yeah. And character is a person, mm -hmm. right? So. But but the, but what, what the API did is it created the connection between a film and a character, like in a, a person, and it's it called the connection a character, and on the implementation it said, how do you connect those two? Because the connection could be obvious, like something you could generate from the database if it's simple, but it could be not obvious at all. It could be like a whole business logic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why GraphQL is cool because here you transferred into all of that into one query, but um, but it doesn't mean, uh, but the connection is not, doesn't have to be trivial. It could be something very complex, like something that is completely business logic that you create for the front end, it doesn't matter. Like maybe character is even something that I don't know, a machine learning algorithm is like figuring out what is the connection. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The front end is like, it's one uh, request. I don't know if it's uh, what you asked, but. Um, almost, almost, uh, because. Uh, yeah, so, but, but this we need to define it in our resolver functions, right? Exactly, right? exactly. 
Yeah, so this this thing you need to do it in your resolver functions, this uh, mapping, so that yeah. like yeah. unless you have a data source that understands that. So what what, what do I mean by that? Yeah. If you have like um like if you have a Postgres database, then you have these connections, or you have like all kinds of graph database like databases like uh, um, because then you can assume things. The thing about GraphQL itself, like there, well, let's separate GraphQL and all kinds of implementations of GraphQL. Um, the thing about GraphQL itself is that um, you could build it on top of anything. So um, you might build it on something that doesn't have any relationships. So you have to, so you have to define the relationships and you have to say what's possible and what's not. That's why GraphQL itself is not necessarily the tool if you want to just automatically create connections. But if you build it on top of Postgres or on top, top of uh, Fauna or DGraph, all, all kinds of, I'll show you like Fauna. Um, fauna um, or all kinds of like databases like that, that they create the connections, then yeah, the API, the GraphQL API you will get will have all these connections automatically. Or a Neo4j, you know, the, they have a GraphQL API that automatically is being generated from Neo4j. So then all those connections are coming out of the box. Uh, but if you put it again on like some random REST APIs that you don't, you're not sure of, you can't get any guarantee and GraphQL is just a protocol on top of anything. So you have, but once you create those connections, you can expose anything. You can expose, yeah, any connection you can think of. Yeah. Very interesting, thank you. And meanwhile, I also wrote a couple of lines in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you check it, these are basically the resources which we have. Uh, we have slash user uh, and we have slash messages. And for example, when you said we, we want to combine the messages and the user, mm -hmm. then we use maybe another endpoint where slash me or slash user slash one, where we refer uh, to yeah. one. Exactly, exactly. And uh, my question was, or, or you, you also answered my question with the double filtering and more complex scheme or, the, or more complex mm -hmm. query, that was perfect. And the other part was like, what if I'm using the same endpoint with different parameters and I want to combine that? Like at my current application, I'm asking for the details of three different users, and this means three different uh, HTTP requests. Yes. Uh, could I combine it into one uh, query without preparing uh, with, a per with an array of parameters endpoint? I don't want to change yeah. the endpoint. It's okay for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and this is a perfect exact. So that's what's happening here. Uh, so think about all films. Um, all films, you might get an endpoint. You, you might get an endpoint to get, you know, it's like, so first of all, um, let's do it in another way. Let's take the opposite. Let's take our car. Let's see. Um, let's take here and take the ID. Uh, let, let's do something similar. Mm -hmm. um, For me, that also means, uh, or, or at least, what you show now for me it means like i have to change my backend but let's say i have one endpoint which you already showed person and uh, then you say person id is something so you already have this endpoint uh -huh. and i want to fire three times the same request with different parameters can i combine it to one without changing the backend so you mean so so again in this uh yeah so Basically, let's let's take uh, three different people. Let's take let, let's say user is uh, um, yeah okay. So let's instead so we have like a couple of characters and let's say we want the other way around. We want it the characters. Let's say um, we want person and we have the person. Um, they do this, and we want. Let's see what we have for person. And like the person messages, let's say we want the person's. Uh, um, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, uh, like let's say let's say the films. Yeah, so uh, films. Uh, 
So now we took one person and we got all of their films. Yeah. Even though um, maybe there's no, like what the underlying REST API was, we might just get all the, it might be anything. It might be like, let, can you just give me all the messages of every, all, all the, sorry, not the message, the films of everyone, give me the person and then the GraphQL API curated that connection. So, you know, even if that connection is not possible on the rest, you can do it here. What you're asking me is like, could you do this? Could you do something like this, like this, plus this, plus, this, plus yeah, another? Kind of, the, yeah, the same thing multiple times in one request. Yeah, so um, out of the box, GraphQL won't give it to you. And here it wasn't implemented, but it's extremely easy to add. Like it's basically like probably yeah, like a couple of lines of codes here in the resolver, and yeah, and then you just get, you know, okay. it's just work. Yeah. Okay, I see. Because I, I think that's a use case which happening time to time that you yeah. using REST API, you want to get the details of multiple entities, which, which are the same type of object, and then you fire just the same request with, with different parameters uh, again and again. Yeah, and so, again. so here it's easy. You just need to take the it's just here the filterings that they've done is very basic. My guess is because they just modeled it, it after this. But uh, you could you could decide the inputs here, the input uh, field, however you like. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the PostGraph file stuff, they generate the inputs here. So automatically you get to send. Uh, they automatically create like by ID and by IDs. Right, because but, right. but that's because they know what is the backend structure. Mm. Here, you just need to create it, but it's yeah, it's a couple of lines of code on the resolver. It's like really, yeah, it's it's the answer is yes, basically. Okay. You just change the schema to to add this uh, those fields. Mm -hmm. The uh, person, yeah. Name. Um, yeah, I don't know here right now, but it's it's very it's it's very very easy. Like okay, okay, got it. All got defined it. by you. It's all defined by you, so you could just add like the after, first, before, last is not something generated. It's not something you will get in another. It's something they actually built. So you can just add here IDs. Mm -hmm. I see. And meanwhile, Venki also has the question in the chat. For beginners, can you document a curriculum resources for learning GraphQL, reference implementation, sample project when you know it before? Yeah, no, that's a good that's a good thing. So first of all, I do think that if you go to graphql.org and learn for go for the learn section, it's really worth reading everything. Most people skip it. But everything in this page, including all the best practices, is valuable. I really highly recommend to read it, even if you already started doing GraphQL already. Now, then there's how to, first of all, in terms of also, we just changed the code page. So now um, you can see the libraries here. You have server libraries, uh, client libraries, um, and the tools. And they're all ordered by most popular tools and everything like that. So th this is just also a great resources to find the most popular tools out there and where what tools you want to learn. So uh, I would really go to here like JavaScript tools. If, it, if you're JavaScript, you can go to like, you, you have you know any language here that you can think of. Um, then um, from the community page, they link to the to the Discord and stuff like that. I would also skim through that. But in terms of tutorials, I would say there's how to GraphQL, but um, how to GraphQL is a bit outdated, but we just created a PR, I'll link it here. And I think you should start from that PR actually. I hope it will be merged soon. Um, this one, this is a new tutorial by us. Um, you, you have, you even have a link here for a deployed version, uh, but you can just follow the tutorial and you have also all the files here. Um, so this is, in my opinion, the current best tutorial out there. 
stuff from. Sounds good. And I think, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, and in terms of reference implementations, also I, uh, there's the link I sent before for the GraphQL bleeding edge. I'll send it again. Uh, that's a good one as well. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. I will highly recommend. And if you're doing TypeScript or JavaScript on the back end, um, I highly recommend to use that server framework envelope. Uh, and there's the, in the docs, you have like examples and you have recipes for all kinds of things. And uh, you have guides for, you know, authentication and authorization and monitoring and um, caching and all kinds of stuff that you want to do when you're using the server. So, yeah. Hope it's enough. And if not, just ping me and I can add more things. Yeah, thank you. Sounds good. Maybe one last question. Uh, when you are using GraphQL on the front end, it, it comes always with TypeScript out of the box, I, I guess. Mm. Or no, good question. No, it's just an HTTP call that you send the string of the request. That's all. Um, that's why you don't have to use Apollo, for example. Like actually starting, you could actually take your existing, let's say, whatever you use REST APIs for, let's say you use uh, Fetch or you use Axios or whatever you use today to send HTTP requests, you just take the same, but you just send, um, you do the same, but you just send the, the query string. And that's it. No, you don't need to get too complex with it. And then slowly you can, you know, get more complex. But I would start with that. Like if there's like, I think there's, um, uh, let's see, GraphQL curl. Like, here, yeah, GraphQL clients. Like, what you see here is like the simplest way to send a GraphQL query, right? You just send a curl message. Mm -hmm. That's all, right? So, GraphQL is just, GraphQL clients can just be that. Then you can build, you see, like this fetch with, you know, the most basic thing that you can think of. Um, I'll send it. Here as well, but um, but later on, you, there's all kinds of graphical clients. Like if you go here to code, you want to get more complex and to add more features. And again, I think you should do it later. Then you can go to this section, and you see you have uh, all kinds of clients that have yeah. extra features like a pull client, amplify, graphical request, relay, um, mm -hmm. and also graph graphical graphical. Um, so it's just a curl for GraphQL to auto complete. You know, some some stuff that are more basic. Got it. And if you jump back to the online editor, where for example, where you where you wrote the swappy uh, queries. Exactly, yes. yes. Here you get basically some kind of syntax validation and auto completion, uh -huh. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. So first of all, this tool that I'm uh, uh, showing here, it's called Graphical. A link, a link to it, um, and that you could get just out of the box from any Graphical server. So it's really cool, and it's open source. And uh, we're now starting to maintain, go back to maintaining it in a well manner. So. This is just because this tool you get automatically on any GraphQL API, just because of the characteristics of the GraphQL API and the schema introspection and all of that, this comes built in, in GraphQL, basically. Um, and I want to say another thing about that. Oh, but then let's say you're writing inside your VS Code extension. Exactly, for that. that's what I wanted and, to um, You have a lot of like VS Code extensions that are, um that can do the same inside your vs code and i'll also add another thing you have something called uh, so if you just do graph your vs code or you just inside your your vs code uh, let me open mine um yeah so you just this is probably the most popular one but um 
Or like there's many, and then you see you can here you can get like autocomplete and all those things and validations and everything inside your uh, inside your VS Code. I link to that as well. But there's also another new library that we um, discussed, um, that we just released. It's called GraphQL ESV. And what's cool about that library is that um, it uses ESLIM to validate your schema and your queries. So it's actually would link, not only would do rules that like the auto completion and everything that you saw here, but you can also create your own custom rules in the company. So for example, we created it because, um, you know, we work with huge companies and it's very hard to tell everyone, look, now you need to write your queries in a certain way. This is the new standard we write. But we use this tool to actually automatically run it on across all the code bases. And then people get, um, you know, get the, the errors or the, of those custom rules everywhere. And there's also like a whole marketplace of rules in there. So uh, you now like you see here, you see you get like, you know, all the auto, it just fits into your uh, VS code and it tells you like the regular rules, but also more than that, you know, like the, here is like a best practice, right? That you don't write, a, you should name a query. So it's not, it doesn't have to, if I'll go to graphical here, it won't tell me, but here you can, because it's a custom rule that we created. And we created also a list of recommended rules uh, and you can create your own. So it's really cool. I, I, I linked to it, uh, um, I linked to it, uh, that's the library, and I linked to it in the chat. Thank you, it looks pretty good. And may, maybe, can you tell us a bit more about the adoption of GraphQL? How does it look like? How many, you know, big companies, small companies? Uh, what so I can say, uh, let's see, um, the easiest way is to go here. I'll, I'll just share, like, I'll just go here and then I'll share my experience. So here, of course, those those companies that you see here are here since 2015, basically. Like there's a lot of very, very big companies that adopted GraphQL very early on. You can see here, you know, many companies, IBM, Facebook, CNBC, Twitter, Starbucks, it's everywhere now. It's mm -hmm. really, really everywhere. Um, there's a full, um, here there's like full landscape, but those are again, are people that actually took the time to PR and to add themselves here, but there's, it's insane. We, um, you know, one of the, even just on the, like for the guild for us, you can see, we just named very few, just a bit of, you know, clients that, you know, uh, some of our clients here and, you know, you can see like, you know, Microsoft, KLM, Air France, Uber, Klarna, Outreach, Nordia, like mm -hmm. really, really, it, it's everywhere now. Um, I think people are, so at the beginning I had to advocate for it and I did a lot of talks like this. Now, you know, I just did the talk for fun because it's like people are already coming to us online. There's tons of demand. Um, I think it's just gonna grow. And again, I think it's, uh, it, it's, gonna, it, it's gonna grow because it's beyond if it's better than rest or not. It's just a developer tool. And I think with time, people would see that. Um, and actually it's interesting because in the, what you see here, for example, is the graph. The graph is like from, it's a very interesting uh, protocol from the crypto space. And what you see now is in the crypto space, um, they're really going on building on GraphQL, which is very, very interesting. Um, so I think, because I think they understand, and you see here, this is all GraphQL. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. to query blockchain data. So I, I think, oh, and here, by the way, it's related to what you said, like what are the automatic filterings I get? So they're actually building it on top of Postgres. So you can see automatic, you can say do order by and all kinds of like GraphQL, uh, like database related filterings automatically. So um, I think it's just the more, more and more people understand that it's more than just an API and you could use it everywhere and yeah, it's really, really growing and it gives you benefits on the front end and it gives you back benefits on the back end. So even individually, not as an API gateway, 
it's powerful and worth it. Uh, so slowly, I think, uh, yeah, the adoption is just growing all the time. Yeah. Sounds pretty good. Any more questions? If there are no more questions, then 